Hello, and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 11 on the topic of Jupiter. We've been going through the planets, working our way out from the Sun, and we've made our way to Jupiter, the first of the Jovian planets, the gas giants and the ice giants. This is not a terrestrial world like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which we've already talked about. All right, so let's get into Jupiter. Of course, we'll talk about the orbital and physical properties of the planet. We'll talk about Jupiter's atmosphere. We'll talk about a cometary impact, so a comet crashing into Jupiter is just a, a rare opportunity to study the effects of such an impact. We'll talk about the internal structure. What's beneath those clouds? What's beneath that giant red spot, which we know to be a storm? Was it almost a star? Now, this is a great question because this is something you hear a lot, kind of everyday conversation. You know, Jupiter is a failed star. Is that true? Let's see. Jupiter's magnetosphere, that's its magnetic field and the space it fills up. The moons of Jupiter, which are quite famous in their historical context, as Galileo was the first astronomer to spot them with an early telescope, with an early telescope, and we've known about them ever since. And of course, we've discovered many moons since, but those have a lot of historical importance, those first four moons. And Jupiter even has a ring. All right, so let's get to it. So here we have Jupiter's orbit, if you look right in here. So definitely further from the sun than these much smaller orbits where all the terrestrial planets are found, all four of them, okay? But also outside of the asteroid belt. Now, we skipped over the asteroid belt. We'll come back to that later in the semester, but certainly that does exist between Jupiter and the orbit of Mars, all right? The solar system is indeed pretty planar like this. We know that the orbits have some, some tilt to the ecliptic plane, but it, it basically is disc-shaped. And as we continue at this scale, we go out and we see that the other planets, with the exception of Saturn, are very far away. Uranus and Neptune have orbits that are dramatically further, making Jupiter look downright close to the sun. And then at the very edge, we have the Kuiper belt, the edge of the solar system. Things to talk about as we continue. But we've really begun to enter the outer solar system. And I suppose we really cross that threshold when we pass outside of the asteroid belt. We cross the so-called frost zone. We enter a part of the solar system where hydrogen compounds like H2O, but methane and ammonia as well, can readily freeze, okay? Because there's not enough radiant energy in space. Even though things boil at very low temperature in the near vacuum of space, because there's very little pressure, so molecules can freely move, well, when we get so far out, so distant from the sun, there's so little energy that despite that low pressure, we have ice, ice forming as small molecular clumps and then eventually aggregating into bigger and bigger clumps and then forming chunks of ice that led to the formation of planets like Jupiter, okay? All because of those hydrogen compounds, those frozen hydrogen compounds like H2O, all right? So continuing with the orbital and physical properties of Jupiter, well, Three, let's look at three views of Jupiter, all right? So from an Earth-based telescope, we can see the planet, we can see the rings from the high-speed winds, right? You might be able to see the red spot depending on the orientation of the planet. You can clearly see one, two, three, four, all four of the Galilean moons. Those are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all right? If we look at another view, this is without the effects of the Earth's atmosphere and a very high quality telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, that's what Jupiter looks like. And then in a recent mission that flew past Jupiter, the Cassini spacecraft, space probe, right, unmanned space probe, looked at this close up flyby shot of Jupiter, showing the incredible detail of these clouds. They're quite striking and beautiful. Okay, so what are the numbers? Well, the mass of Jupiter is 1.9 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. And to compare that to Earth, the Earth is on the order of 10 to the 24. So we see three orders of magnitude, right? So it's over a thousand times more massive. It is twice as much as all the other planets put together. Again, it's a thousand times more massive than Earth, right? Or you know, at least three orders of magnitude more. Um, it's it Maybe I think it works out to be probably about 500 times more massive. And that's, Remarkable, because even if we include the other gas giants, the other planets like Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they still don't total one half of the mass of Jupiter. So Jupiter is truly a massive planet, okay? 
It has a radius that's about 11 times that of Earth. You might be like, wait, you said it's a thousand times bigger. Well, that's its mass, right? But volume goes up as a cube of, of the mass, right? And so what's happening, at least a cube of the radius. And so then what's happening is that you have not nearly as much radius change as there is mass change. Because again, to say that more clearly, mass and volume are directly proportional to each other. So we can say mass is proportional to volume, but the radius is not. It's proportional to the cube of volume or the cube root. So the radius is proportional to the volume to the one third power, that's the cube root, in the same way that the volume would be proportional to the radius to the third power, okay? That's why it's 11 times bigger, but so many times more massive, okay? Still quite a bit bigger. It has a density of 1,300 kilograms per cubic meter, all right? That's dramatically less than the terrestrial planets. The terrestrial planets have densities that are on, on the order of maybe 5,000 kilograms per cubic meter because there is a lot of rock and heavy, heavy metals in the interiors of the terrestrial planets, but not here, right? So it cannot be nearly as rocky or metallic as the inner planets. So most of its actual internal volume must be filled with something else that isn't rock. Otherwise, it would have to have a higher density. Right? So right away, you know, scientists can reason out what's in there, even though they can't, we can't actually you know, go inside of Jupiter. We can reason out what, what it must be made of. Okay, It has a rotation rate that is problematic as Jupiter has no solid surface. Different parts of the atmosphere rotate at different rates. So you can't actually clearly define one rotation rate. There's differential rotation. So differential rotation means that the uh, basically the equatorial regions are actually turning faster. All right, rotation. It's not a solid. It's you know it it's yeah. There's some you know there's some average rotation rate, but there's also significant difference between the rotation rate of the equatorial regions and the polar regions. You know, so they're constantly shearing against each other. All those layers of gases and and you know and pressurized gases that become liquids beneath beneath the cloud cloud layer. All of that you know is rotating at different rates. Okay, um, you know the core itself is probably solid enough that that's rotating as a solid, but not the outer layers. Okay, and from the magnetic field, we can deduce that the average rotation rate or the rotation rate of the core must be nine hours and fifty five minutes. And that's based on the strength of the field and the behavior, the, the particular dynamic behavior of the magnetic field, which we can carefully measure based on the way it interacts with electric fields and you know the, the whole electricity and magnetism of a magnetic field. Okay, all right, so good details there. All right, so let's talk from the outside in and start with Jupiter's atmosphere, all right? So the most visible features, first things that come to mind if we talk about Jupiter's atmosphere, are the bands of clouds. We saw those in that you know, Earth-based small telescope. You can clearly see the bands right in the Hobby telescope. And the Great Red Spot is quite famous. Okay, Great Red Spot is, is famous. It's so, so neat to, to tell people about it, to show the scale of worlds other than our own, because it is the size of Earth. Right? So the diameter of Earth is smaller than the, di the diameter of the Great Red Spot. All right, as you can see, obviously they, you know, they're slightly different shapes, but you know, regardless, the Great Red Spot is bigger than Earth. Amazing, because it's just one storm. It's a very dramatic storm that has been going on for centuries or a couple thousand years or longer, but certainly for a lot longer than a human lifetime. Okay, very cool. What else about the atmosphere? Well, it has bright zones and dark belts. All right, so zones are cooler and are higher are higher than the belts, all right? So the, the bright zones are cooler and higher, all right? More reflective, okay? The stable flow, called the zonal flow, underlies the zones and the bands. It's the cause, it's the, the underlying condition, all right? And this is a simplified model, but it's just catching on the idea that there are zones and, well, belts, okay? And again, notice that zones are higher in elevation, than the belts, okay? And notice they go in different directions, but the terms, and these are just arbitrary terms, right? Are zones and belts, and that is the zonal wind pattern, okay? And it runs east-west, okay? Perpendicular to north-south, as we can kind of see here, right? This could be the north direction, okay? And obviously planet center, as we lose elevation, is down that way, okay? Good. Now, 
the idea about the wind speeds is the wind speeds are greatest and the ro rotation as well, just the overall movement of the atmosphere is greatest at the equatorial regions. Okay, so the real picture is much more complicated, but an average snapshot in time showing the velocity of wind speeds, okay, with respect to the internal rotation rate, not the differential rot rotation rate, just the wind speed with respect to that rotation rate that had the period of nine hours and 55 minutes that was tied into the strength of magnetic field, that rotation rate. Well, these wind speeds relative to them show really kind of the same idea that everything's faster around the equator, but here it's not, it's not just the rotation that's faster, it's also the wind. There's incredibly high speed winds around the equator. There's also you know, some that, that are not exactly at the equator, you know, some you know, almost like the tropics, right, above and below the equator, but we certainly see a, a decline as we move to the pole. So there's just less, less high speed winds. It is also important to notice that these winds are incredibly high speed, you know, in the range, these high, these peaks here, so the peaks like these, in the range of 200 to 500 kilometers per hour. You know, and a hurricane strength wind is like 150 kilometers per hour, right? Or 150 miles per hour, so maybe around 200 kilometers per hour. But these are hurricane plus, right? Having something on the range of 400 kilometers per hour, these are unearthly speed winds, and they're steady winds. So just, you know, it would be a, a very hostile environment. You know, you couldn't, you know, easily take a take a, a, a craft out into the clouds of Jupiter, certainly not at the equator. It would get torn apart just from the winds. Okay. So let's talk about the composition of the atmosphere. So it's mostly molecular hydrogen. Okay. So hydrogen is so important to understanding Jupiter. Jupiter has a lot of hydrogen in it. Okay. It is the most common or abundant um, atom, hydrogen is, in the universe, okay? Now the second most common atom in the universe is helium, and there's also a lot of helium in the atmosphere of Jupiter, okay? There's a lot of helium in the universe, just like there's even more hydrogen in the universe. These are the same things that the sun is made of, hydrogen and helium, primarily, okay? So, right, there is some compositional similarity then between a gas giant like Jupiter and a star like the sun, okay? When we say molecular hydrogen, by the way, we're talking about H2, that's a stable molecule. It's called diatomic hydrogen. It's just two hydrogen atoms. Okay. There are also small amounts of other hydrogen compounds like methane, ammonia, and water. Okay. And these these really are the big three: methane, ammonia, water, of uh, being common hydrogen compounds with other common elements like oxygen, and so on. Okay. Okay. Though so these cannot account for the color, right? These these elements, right? If we it was just these elements. We're not that that would not explain the color. So there's probably more complex chemical reactions. Almost certainly, there are other trace chemicals that contribute to the particular spectrum that we see in those 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 gases. Okay, the, the emission spectrum. Now this is a common type of picture. We've seen this with all of our planets, where we show the altitude, some color coding, and then we show the temperature. So we see the temperature variation at different altitudes. We've seen it as a way to compare between planets and talk about the incredibly high surface temperatures of a planet like Venus compared to the cooler temperatures, much cooler temperatures of a planet like Mars that doesn't have a protective atmosphere or an oppressive atmosphere for that matter. We've, we've seen it to always notice the upper trend as the temperature goes up as we move very far away because of the absorption of high energy photons like x-rays um, and, um, well, x-rays, but also ultraviolet, um, and that's going to raise the temperature, but that doesn't mean heat because it's very low density, obviously, as you get to the very upper edges of space, okay, as the atmosphere thins out and we truly enter outer space. So these are all the same ideas with Jupiter, but one thing that's different is where we've marked the zero point, because with the terrestrial worlds, zero was always at the bottom. Because there was no, it was it made no sense to talk about the atmosphere beneath beneath zero. But here, there's no clear transition because there is an atmosphere beneath zero. At some point, the atmosphere just becomes so thick that the density causes a phase change from a gas to a liquid. But that's gradual. There's not like a a lick, There's not an ocean of of you know of pressurized gases beneath the cloud layer. There's just a gradually gradually thickening of it. Okay, but at that zero point, we consider that the top of the clouds, the top of the troposphere specifically, that is our zero kilometer, okay? So that is right right at the upper layer of the troposphere, right where it's in the transition into the stratosphere, where the absorption of those high energy photons are occurring, okay? Energy photon. The lowest cloud layer cannot be seen by op optical telescopes, 
So as we get into the very, very lowest layers of the gaseous hydrogen, helium, methane, ammonia, and water, right? So we have to see those in the other spectrum, such as infrared primarily. Measurements by Galileo probe show high wind speeds even at great depths, even say 100 kilometers beneath the upper, upper top or top of the clouds. All right, and that's probably due to the, a lot of heat that's coming out of the planet, because otherwise there wouldn't be the energy to drive the motion that that far beneath the cloud layer. What what's driving that? What's causing you know all the, all that high speed motion so deep down in the planet? Well, it must be heating from the planet itself. And we're gonna come back to that idea of the energy source of the planet, heating within the planet, not coming from the sun. Okay, all right. But you can see troposphere, ammonia ice underneath. Deeper down, ammonium hydrosulfide ice. Finally, a layer of water ice. And then we get down to the gases, hydrogen, helium, methane, ammonia, and water as we go deeper down into the pr increasingly pressurized atmosphere. Okay? And notice as we get down into that gases, hydrogen, we have a pressure that is 10 Earth's atmospheres. Crushing pressure. Okay? Crushing pressure. And it is important to consider that that's occurring where you have gaseous hydrogen, you have that maybe molecular hydrogen, H2, because you need high pressure to, to hold on to hydrogen. In low pressure environments, hydrogen will just gradually escape because it is so small that it's very easy for it to pick up high velocities, high enough velocities that it has a likelihood of just escaping out into space. And over time, that likelihood means an inevitability. Okay, But here it's, it's pressurized, it's trapped down in there. Okay, and we'll notice as we go deeper into the planet, that pressure then will actually phase change the hydrogen. Going back to the great red spot, it's ex existed for at least 300 years, okay, but probably much longer, right? Now, how do we know the 300? That's from observation. Okay, so we've been observing it, astronomers have been observing it since around Galileo's time for the last 300 years. Now, within 100 years of Galileo, okay? So the color and energy source are still not understood, right? So with the second time we mentioned that the color has to do with chemical reactions that are an active field of study, all right? Lightning-like light, lightning -like flashes have been seen, also shorter-lived rotating storms, all right? So an example, the brown own, um, oval, which is really a large gap in the clouds, but look at this, over 5,000 kilometers across, huge storm formation, but more unstable than last, all right? Here we can see the white storms, Okay, so three white storms were observed to merge into a single st storm, and then it turned red. So obviously the, the higher energy um, had some sort of reaction on the color, and this may provide some clues to the dynamics behind the cloud mov movement, as well as what the color tells us. All right, we mentioned in terms of our discovery in their table of contents that we're gonna talk about a comet, which is a cometary impact, so the, an, an impact of a comet, because in 1994, with telescopes trained on the planet, the comet shoemaker Levy 9, 9 broke into fragments and struck Jupiter, providing valuable information about what cometary impacts look like. Okay, So it kind of got torn apart from, from um, the gravitational pull of Jupiter, but then fell as a series of impacts. Imagine it kind of raining down and each of these hitting the surface and creating these big infrared signals from the heat that was would be coming up from the atmosphere as those chunks of comet tore through that the aforementioned you know, layers of methane clouds and water ice, okay? And here we can see the track of it in the visible spectrum and then the disruption in the cloud as it kind of fills in the space that was pushed apart from the high energy collision, okay? Here's the, the kind of the moment of the collision. Okay, so pretty interesting stuff. So on to the internal structure, enough about the atmosphere, let's work down into the planet. So we find that Jupiter radiates, I said we'd come back to this, more energy than it receives. Okay, so there's more energy coming out of Jupiter than going into it. How is that possible, right? Because we think of the energy source of the solar system being the fusion within the sun, okay? Earth absorbs more energy than it, than it outputs, okay? There is internal sources of energy inside our planet from the radioactive decay of heavy elements. Is that what's going on inside Jupiter just on a larger scale? Well, it turns out no. Its core is still cooling from heating during gravitational compression. So the energy source, the primary, primary energy, primary energy source, excuse me there, of Jupiter's core is not radioactive decay, but instead is gravitational potential energy. Okay, it's just left over from when the planet itself contracted. 
right? And you might say, wait, really? After all this time? Well, it takes a long time for that energy to make its way back out. In individual, you know, photons carrying the energy from, from the gravitational collision, um, and then, you know, due to the emission of thermal radiation, well, they might take thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years to make their way out of the planet in the same way that photons take up to a million years to make their way out of the sun. And so the process does take billions of years. It's a very slow cooling process for a planet like Jupiter. Okay. And we'll see that's also true of Saturn. Saturn is even more dramatic because because of the, you know, because of the cooling process and the continued condensation of the planet. Okay. But in, in Jupiter's case, it's just slowly cooling. All right. Now, the aforementioned question, could Jupiter have been a star? Okay. So, well, no, not at all. It's really a myth. Okay, people love to say Jupiter is a failed star. It wasn't anywhere close. Our solar system was not even close to a binary star system. Okay, it's far too cool and too small. It would have had to have been 80 times more massive. Okay, considering that it already has over twice as much mass as the rest of the solar system, there was no way that there was enough material in the solar system to have 80 more, 80 more times worth. Our solar system was nowhere, nowhere close to those conditions to have enough mass to form a second star. Okay? All right. Okay? So, no direct information is available about Jupiter's interior. We can't, we can't send probes down in there. Okay? But its main components, hydrogen and helium, are quite well understood. Right? We know a lot about hydrogen and helium. We know what to expect. We know what to look for in terms of the emissions, in terms of the dynamics, you know, exploring the density, exploring different models, testing those models, right? So what we can get then, what we can reason out is that the central portion must be rocky. Okay, so we know that there are, there's, there, there's just heavier elements spread throughout the solar system. Those heavier elements would have been present in all the ice that, that formed Jupiter, just in trace amounts. Now that's, that's all there is in the terrestrial planets, which is why terrestrial planets are so much smaller because there was only so much of those heavier elements. Well, those heavier elements also existed beyond the frost line where planets like Jupiter formed. They were just, again, encased in ice, but they're still there. They would have absolutely sunk to the center of the forming world, the liquid world of Jupiter in its early stages. There must be heavy elements, whether those are sil silicon molecules, whether those are carbon molecules, the heavier elements, iron certainly, they're all gonna exist inside of the core. Now, now they might not they might not exist in, in large amounts. It might not really even be like a molten core, like a, a liquid molten um, you know metal core like from our own planet. Um, it you know it may just be kind of cold and pressurized. But whatever whatever the case is, there is a rocky core. Okay, all right. But outside of that rocky core, there is a metallic hydrogen level. All right, or layer really. All right. So notice, right, the rocky core is this red color, but then this pinkish color outside, that's the metallic hydrogen. Why metallic hydrogen? Well, because that's hydrogen that has been pressurized so much that it's phase changed from a typical gas into a liquid and then into a solid. So metallic hydrogen is solid hydrogen. Okay, it's a solid phase of hydrogen and it behaves like a metal, hence the term metallic hydrogen. It's not practical to create metallic hydrogen on Earth because the pressure requirements would be too great. But the pressure, the pressure um, at that le at that level is about 40 million Earth Earth atmospheres. Okay, 40 million Earth atm atmospheres in the metallic hydrogen level. Unbelievably high pressure. Okay. So to reiterate that it was not almost a star, Jupiter is much too small to ha have become a star. It needs 80 80 times our mass that simply wasn't available. But its energy output was larger in the past, okay? So it, it went through a phase where it was cooling much more quickly. So it would have been about 100 times brighter than the moon as seen from Earth. And that's in about the first 500 million years of the solar system, okay? A dwarf star in Jupiter's place probably would have made stable uh, planetary orbits impossible, at least planetary orbits where Earth or is orbiting. If there were stable orbits, they would be well out past the Kuiper belt or kind of in what we now call the Kuiper belt, which we'll lecture on later. All right, but point is there wasn't enough matter to even support a, door, a second dwarf star. All right, and Jupiter played an invaluable role in sweeping the solar system clear of debris before too much reached Earth. Otherwise, life on Earth might not have been possible, okay? So it's, it's good to think about, it's a good thing it wasn't another star because Earth wouldn't be here. And um, furthermore, Jupiter plays an important role in explaining the 
kind of the period of relative calm that led to more complex organisms being able to evolve early in Earth's history. Okay, you know, and so basically, like kind of the tail end of a, of the bombardment era, the first 500 million years, then being able to start evolving life on Earth. Okay, all right. So Jupiter also direct some things towards the inner solar system, but in early, you know, today it does at least, but early on its gravitational role was more important as a protective role to protect the inner planets. Okay, so on to its magnetosphere. We've talked about its atmosphere, we've talked about its internal structure. What about its magnetic field? Magnetic fields are something we should always think about when we think about planets. We've talked about that with all our terrestrial planets. Now, when we talk about the magnetic fields of the Jovian worlds, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, we're always going to talk about large magnetospheres. They all have them. They all have magnetic fields, not like some of the terrestrial worlds do. If you can recall, right, some don't. Okay, Venus does not have a magnetic field at all. Okay, now, but all the Jovian worlds do. That said, Jupiter's is by far the coolest. It's by far the most impressive. It's huge. It dwarfs the other magnetospheres. Okay. So it's surrounded by belts of charged particles, much like the Van, uh, Van Allen belts, but vastly larger. Van Allen belts are around Earth. Magnetosphere is 30 million kilometers across. It's, it's so big that it you know, comes up out of the ecliptic plane. It's, it, it's, it's larger than the sun. So the magnetic, the magnetic field, so if, if we were to draw the sun to scale, the sun would not be as big as the magnetosphere of Jupiter. It's just that large. Now the sun has an even larger magnetic field that, that interacts with that of Jupiter, right? So there's a overall solar system-wide magnetic field. But regardless, we shouldn't downplay this, 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 this scale of the magnetosphere. Um, it houses a lot of the moons. So many of Jupiter's moons are within its magnetosphere. That's certainly not really true of Earth's magnetosphere. It, our, our magnetic field has basically become almost too diminutive in magnitude by the time you get to the moon for it to matter much. Not the case here. It's got, we have moons within the magnetosphere, okay? There's a plasma torus, we'll talk about that briefly, okay? And, and, there's, and the magnetic field gets pushed out in this direction, which is true of all magnetic fields, um, because of the solar wind, which is a constant bombardment of charged particles, um, largely, largely electrons, but also um, other charged particles that you know, is pushed away from the sun. And so all, all magnetic fields have a tail like this, but Jupiter's is so huge that the tail, the current sheet, as it's called, extends all the way out to Saturn's orbit, okay, as you can see here. Okay, so the intrin intrinsic field um, strength is 20,000 times that of Earth. So, I mean, this is a really strong magnetic field, 20,000 times stronger than Earth, okay? The magnetosphere can extend beyond the orbit of Saturn, as I mentioned, okay? Now, on to the moons, because I mentioned the moons are within that magnetosphere, and we don't have much else to say about, about, about the magnetic sphere. Oh, actually, I do have one more thing to say, if you'll let me return here. The, the magnetic field, I'll actually go back to here, the magnetic field is made by the planet, okay? And it's formed from one from a couple of primary things, okay? It's formed from the high rotation, because having high rotation means essentially the um, rotation it is that the planet is acting like a motor, like a gyro, right? It's fast, like it's like spinning something. So spinning something is good for generating electricity. Same idea here. There's, if you spin something quickly and you, know, you generate a current, then that current in turn can generate the magnetic field. So that's the idea. But you need to have a wire in order to get a current. What plays the role of the wire on a huge scale inside the planet? The metallic hydrogen, okay? So that metallic hydrogen is able to conduct electricity. Then you have that conducting layer inside the planet and you spin it at a very high rate, again, because I mean, it, the, the day of Jupiter is only nine Earth hours, right? So you have this massive planet that's spinning faster than Earth, and then you have a bunch of metallic hydrogen to conduct the electricity. That's the ingredients, okay? That, that's part of the reason that scientists first speculated there was metallic hydrogen, um, you know, again, because it's very exotic, not something we see here on Earth. And, you know, it's just like, it's just part of the story of the huge magnetic field, okay? Metallic hydrogen, fast rotation rate. Okay, now we're ready to move on, move on to the moons. So there are 63 moons, all right, that have been found orbiting Jupiter. Maybe they might, there might be more because a lot of many were cap, uh, caught, uh, caught asteroids. They're hard to find. They're tiny. The four largest are not tiny. They're the Galilean moons, so-called because they were first observed by Galileo, which was part of the argument of why, you know, Earth couldn't be the center of the universe if, universe if other planets had their own moons, okay? 
Their names, the Galilean moons, are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those are in order from closest orbit to furthest of the four. The Galilean moons have similarities to terrestrial planets. They're large, they're planet size, essentially. All right, their orbits have low eccentricity, so they're quite circular. The largest is somewhat larger than Mercury, and the densities decrease as distance from Jupiter increases. Okay, so the most dense by far is Io, so lots of lots of metal in its core. Europa, um, density kind of similar to water, a lot of water. Ganymede is icy rock, and Callisto is mostly ice, so density is going down. Okay, but again, let's appreciate Ganymede is the one that's bigger. Okay, it's the it's the biggest of the four, and it is bigger than Mercury. Right, so it's a moon that's bigger than a planet. It's the only moon that's bigger than a planet, but it, it's Ganymede. Okay. So here's a picture, all right? Now, um, note the relative sizes, all right? So we've got Io, all right? We've got the great red spot, we got Europa, all right? So we can see see these moons in, you know, kind of in front of the planet. Pretty pretty amazing photo, actually, okay? This is just quickly looking at the interiors, all right? So again, we can appreciate that Io has an iron core, right? So very much like, very much like Mercury, right? Um, more so like Mercury than the moon, because the moon doesn't have, our moon that is, doesn't have that much um, uh, heavy metal in its core. But uh, Io certainly does, which it's uh, makes sense because it has a lot of volcanic activity. And uh, I mean, there's probably the heavy elements are mixed in with that uh, volcanic ash and uh, molten lava. All right. But anyway, moving on, we have uh, Europa. Europa does have a core. It also has a subsurface ocean that is maybe 10, 20 kilometers thick. You know, so it has, there's more liquid water, we think, on Europa than there is on Earth amazing okay um and there's would be a rocky layer and at the very top is an icy crust okay all right but we're pretty sure there's a huge liquid ocean of water because we see the way the crust moves can only be explained by having a huge ocean of liquid water underneath all right moving on to ganymede ganymede has um an icy icy layer rock a rocky layer and an iron core callisto does not have an iron core it is just an ice rock mixture callisto is kind of a typical format for outer planets, it's it's what we're going to see for um, well outer dwarf planets. That is, it kind of ha has a similar composition to Pluto, where it's kind of it's almost like just a giant comet. Okay, all right. So Io is the densest of Jupiter's moons. We already pointed that out. It's the most geologically active. It has huge volcanoes. Okay, many active volcanoes. All right, some quite large. It can change the sur uh, surface features in a few weeks because just the huge volcanic flows of lava can just completely resurface sections of the planet. It's, it's constantly changing. Um, no craters, they fill in too fast, because I mean, there's just like, you know, crevices and cracks and, and big, you know, molten fissures and everything, all right? So it has the youngest surface of any solar system object, constantly being refreshed, okay? The orange co uh, pro uh, color of Io is probably from sulfur compounds and all of the dust that gets ejected from uh, volcanoes. The cause of the volcanism. Why is it so volcanically active? What's special about it? It's gravity. Okay, it's very close to Jupiter and also experiences tugs from Europa. It's actually in a resonance with Europa, so it's constantly being tugged on every few days, every few Earth days. And so those tidal forces, the same forces that create tides here on Earth, are actually strong enough to keep rock rubbing against rock, essentially then delivering all that energy. Think of all that frictional energy of rock rubbing against rock. That frictional energy then on a planet-wide scale keeps all the lava molten, keeps all the volcanoes running. Okay? So that's where the energy from the volcanoes comes from, just from gravitational attraction. The planet is just being sheared against itself. And now we mentioned how it's, it's spewing ash into space constantly. Well, those volcanic eruptions eject charged particles out of out of the gravitational pull of the planet leaving a trail of charged particles that interacts with the magnetosphere forming a plasma torus right so it's like a it's like a big it's like a big outer current in addition to the interior current within the planet so it it, it complicates and further strengthens the magnetic field all right on europa also has no craters and that's because its surface is water ice Okay, not ammonia ice or methane ice, water ice, and it's it's constantly shifting around. All right, and so there's probably liquid water below, which would explain this almost like plate tectonic style of huge shifting sheets of water ice. So the tidal forces um, stress and crack the ice, and probably keep the water above freezing. So the the ocean beneath the the layer, maybe the one kilometer thick layer of water on the surface of the moon. The liquid ocean underneath is kept liquid from the same thing that explains the lava staying lava on Io. There's there's energy from tidal forces. There's energy from gravitational pulls from Io, certainly from Jupiter, 
and um, to a lesser lesser extent from Ganymede. Okay, all right. So that's that's um, Europa. Europa is a good candidate for looking for life outside of Earth because all that liquid water and maybe the right nutrients means there could be organisms that live in that subsurface or ocean for all we know. All right. So moving on to Ganymede. All right, the largest moon in the solar system, larger than Pluto. Right, which of course is a dwarf planet, but it's even larger than a real proper planet, Mercury. All right. History is similar to Earth's moon. All right, but with water ice instead of lunar rock. Okay. Callisto, moving right along, is similar to Ganymede, but again more rocky, no no iron core, and no evidence of plate activity. There's not as much gravitational pull. Callisto is significantly further than the other three. It's it's not it is not in the same kind of orbital resonance with the other three, and so it is just a cooler world. It's massive, and you know, and certainly it's being being primarily made of ice. That it's it's easier for there to be some geological activity, but um, certainly not on a plate scale. Okay, and there's lots of craters because they don't get covered back up. All right, and finally, Jupiter's ring. Believe it or not, Jupiter has a ring. In fact, all the Jovian worlds, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, they all have rings. Jupiter's is probably the weakest one. It's small and it's dark. So it basically reflects no light in the visible spectrum. You can only really really see it in the infrared. And this is just because it's an old dark ring that over time, you know, that reflectivity has, has decreased because the smaller, darker particles have got overlaid on the ring, okay? But it, Jupiter does have a ring. All right, so in summary, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system by far. It rotates incredibly rapidly, right? Only nine Earth hours for a full rotation. The cloud cover has three main layers, which forms zones and a band pattern, all right? The great red spot is a very stable storm for at least 300 years. Pressure and density of that atmosphere increase of depth, right? Eventually becoming a liquid and then metallic as you go deep enough down, okay? The relatively small rocky core, but that core, we haven't mentioned this, is still about 10 times bigger than Earth, right? Even though it's just a trace amount of rock compared to all the hydrogen, all right? Still, it is radiating energy from its original formation. It's still gradually cooling, all right, which means more energy is going out than in. It has 63 moons, four big ones. The other, all the other ones are relatively small. Io, famous for its volcanoes due to tidal forces. Europa, its cracked icy surface and the liquid water underneath. And Ganymede and Callisto, which are rocky worlds with lots of ice. Okay, well, there we go. There is chapter 11. I hope it's been a fun journey through some facts about Jupiter. Thank you so much for watching this lecture.